Understanding antennas in theory and practice is a specialty field and will not be covered in great detail here. An introduction to antenna theory and specifications will be covered with hopefully enough information to get the technician or engineer started. Of the many things that impact a system's coverage, the selection, installation, and characteristics of the antenna will be one of the most important. In the simplest form, an antenna is a piece of wire stuck in the air or strung between two trees. The important part of antennas is knowing how long to make the wire and how it should be hung. This section is an introduction to antennas, theory, and specifications. It includes the topics listed in the index here. The index is included for quick reference and you will find the topics on the slides listed. Antennas have the worst specification of any part in LMR transmission systems when compared to transmission line, connectors, lightning arresters, filters, TTAs, and other components, and yet operate allowing communication between radios continually. Antennas are like light bulbs and speaker systems. They are transducers. They take one type of energy and turn it into another. In this case, voltage and current as carried in or on a conductor and turn it into radiated energy. They represent a balanced load to the transmitter and transmission line and work either properly, meeting specifications, or will need to be replaced. Performance will change if any of the physical characteristics change because of weather, damage from ice, wind, lightning, or other natural events. Ice will melt and performance may return, but bullet holes don't fix themselves. A manufacturer's spec sheet will have all the performance characteristics and typical specs will be explained here. Antennas should be swept prior to installation to be sure that the proper antenna was shipped and labeled correctly. Antennas can be damaged in shipment during installation and certainly are susceptible to damage once installed. Lightning, with even the best arresters and grounding, can still cause tremendous damage. If the wrong radome or cover has been supplied, it could interact with the signal, changing coverage. Once mounted, be sure to sweep the antennas periodically to be sure they are still functioning as expected. Antennas are all around us, in our cars, our cell phones, and in every home from dog collars to garage door openers. Transmit antennas come in a large number of varieties, from panel types to omni and unidirectional to elaborate multi-panel arrays. As more uses for radio frequency signals are developed, our understanding of antennas continues to grow. The antenna will determine the pattern of transmission, gain in a specific direction, and will have a major impact on the amount of area covered by the signal. Signal power from the transmitter arrives at the antenna through the transmission line, and a field is set up around the antenna consisting of two parts the electrostatic and the electromagnetic fields caused by the movement of electrons in the antenna itself and charge transferred to the antenna. As the electrons travel from one end of the antenna to the other, the fields around the antenna alternately expand and collapse. However, not all of the energy returns to the antenna as the fields collapse, and some of the energy is sent into the space around the antenna as radio waves. Antennas do not need to be the full wavelength of the frequency of operation. If a full wave antenna were used for the low end of the radio frequency spectrum at 10 kilohertz, it would be nearly 18 miles long. Full wave antennas cut for 890 megahertz would be 0.34 meters long or just over a foot. Many systems use one half or one quarter wavelength antennas, making an 890 megahertz antenna about six inches long for half wave and three inches long for quarter wave. Antennas are constructed of many different materials. A simple antenna can be made of a single length of wire suspended between two trees. If an antenna is made of a single rod mounted vertically, it will have a pattern that radiates out from it in all directions equally. In electrical terms, an antenna is a tuned circuit operating best at a single frequency and having an operational range. 
the starting point and most basic antenna in physics doesn't exist. Known as an isotropic radiator, it radiates and receives equally well in all directions in free space. It is a point source or a perfect sphere, radiating a perfectly spherical wave front in all directions. Antenna patterns and gain may be referenced to an isotropic source and are termed DBI or decibels gain compared to an isotropic source. An isotropic antenna is a theoretical construct, an ideal antenna that is impossible to build. As soon as you connect a feed line to it, you have a null in the pattern and it no longer radiates in all directions. While used as a reference, it is not practical for use in systems. Radiating in all directions equally well means that it radiates upward and downward, and if it were suspended above the ground mounted on a tower, much of the signal would radiate into the ground and into free space above the antenna. For most uses on the planet, signal is needed near the Earth's surface in a lateral direction away from the antenna. A dipole antenna has little or no signal off the ends, and when compared to an, the isotropic antenna, it has 2.15 dB more signal power off the sides of the antenna, resulting in gain or increased signal when compared to an isotropic. A dipole antenna is one of the most common antennas used in land mobile radio. A half-wave dipole is a conductor or radiator that is one half of a wavelength long. The conductor can be a piece of wire, as many ham radio operators use, or it can be a rod of copper, aluminum, or other conductive material. The dipole can be fed the RF signal from the center, or it can be end-fed to the antenna. The radiation pattern from a half-wave dipole is maximum from the sides of the antenna and minimum off the ends. Maximum power output occurs when the antenna's mechanical length and wavelength of the signal are the same. Due to a characteristic known as velocity factor, an antenna is most efficient when the mechanical length of the antenna is slightly shorter than it should be. End effect results in the antenna being about 5% shorter than the calculated length based on the frequency and is caused by a condition known as the velocity factor of the signal as it passes over the surface of the conductor. Antennas, like any communication equipment, must be tested at the site to show that they meet specifications. Two types of test equipment are used to show performance, a vector network analyzer, or VNA, or a frequency domain reflectometer, or FDR, which acts as a single channel VNA. The test equipment shows how well the antenna responds in a specified frequency range. The tests are performed using visoir or return loss and show how much of the power is absorbed by the antenna and how much is reflected back to the source. The graph displayed would represent a typical return loss measurement for an antenna system. When sweeping the antenna for frequency response, care must be taken on how the antenna is handled or what it is close to and what is connected to the antenna, transmission line, or the test equipment. Limit lines and markers are used to make sweeps easier to read. The limit line on this sweep is set for NEG 14 dB return loss, the characteristic specification for an antenna. Return loss in dB is a measure of how much of the power is reflected back to the source. The test points that are below the limit line mean that at some frequencies, very little power is reflected and most is radiated. Markers 1 and 2 on the sweep are set for the upper and lower frequencies of the range of the antenna. If this were a real antenna sweep and not an illustration, the antenna would meet specification for a frequency range of 457 to 473 MHz. The accepted manufacturer specification for antennas has been 1.5 visvar, which is equal to NEG 14 dB return loss. On the sweep shown, all of the sweep must stay below a limit line set for 1.5 visvar or 14 dB return loss within the frequency range of the antenna.
The frequency of a signal is the rate at which similar points on radio waves pass by a fixed location in a specified time period, normally one second. We are counting how many radio or electromagnetic waves are generated in one second. The frequency of both signals on the slide is determined by counting the number of complete waves generated in one second and would be two waves or two cycles per second on the left waveform. The illustration on the right has twice the number of waves or four cycles per second. Cycles per second was used as the common designation, but has been replaced by the term Hertz in honor of Heinrich Hertz, an early radio pioneer. A Hertz is one cycle per second. The waves illustrated would be two Hertz and four Hertz signals. In radio frequency applications, the frequencies are normally very high in the thousands, millions, billions, and trillions of cycles per second. Due to the large numbers involved, it is common to use metric-based prefixes that are powers of 10. A signal of 330,000 hertz, or 330,000 cycles per second, would be given the kilo prefix and would be 330 kilohertz. The usable radio frequency spectrum ranges from a few thousand cycles to many trillions of cycles per second. Much of the work in LMR is performed in the megahertz range, but as data rates require higher bit rates, frequencies have increased. Many applications now use RF spectrum in the gigahertz range. The relationship between speed, frequency, and wavelength is mathematical and is similar to those in electrical or electronic engineering defining voltage, current, and resistance. The relationship is straightforward but the speed of the signal or wave may be impacted by the medium through which the signal or wave is conducted. The basic formula for the relationship is wavelength is equal to the speed of electromagnetic radiation divided by the frequency of the signal. By using the speed of propagation, the speed of light, or 300 million meters per second, divided by the frequency in hertz, the wavelength in meters is calculated. For example, the wavelength of a 174 MHz TV signal is found by dividing 300 million by 174 million, resulting in a wavelength of 1.72 meters. Dropping equal numbers of zeros in the calculation from both of the large numbers simplifies the math considerably. 300 divided by 174 results in the same wavelength. If the wavelength is known, the formula may be rearranged as follows to give the frequency. Frequency is equal to the speed of propagation divided by wavelength. Wavelength is the distance between recurrent points on a wave. Wavelength is measured from one peak to the next or from one x-axis crossing to the next. It may be the distance between two troughs or any other two regularly occurring points on a wave as long as the wave is symmetrical and the points are in the same place along the wave. Wavelength is inversely proportional to frequency. As the frequency increases, the wavelength decreases. As the frequency decreases, the wavelength increases. For spectrum analysis using a spectrum analyzer, the device never displays wavelength. Wavelength is a measure of signal amplitude versus time, or in this case, the x-axis is scaled in distance. The measurement is similar to saying a vehicle is traveling 60 miles per hour, how far does it go in one minute, or how long is one minute's travel? In our case, the signal is traveling at a constant rate, approximately 300 million meters per second. So how long is each wave? If the frequency is 300 megahertz or 300 million cycles per second, it equates to 300 divided by 300 or one meter wavelength. Radio waves travel at the speed of light, which is approximately 300 million meters per second. If we divide meters per second by cycles per second, the result is in meters, the length of one wavelength. Other versions of the formula allow us to compute the value of a wavelength in either feet or meters and to use larger units of frequency such as megahertz. 
The formula is shown compute wavelength in free space. Minor changes to the formula are required for calculation of antenna or transmission line lengths due to end effect or velocity factor. The formulas are also given for measurements using the United States foot. The speed of electromagnetic radiation in free space is 299,792,458 meters per second for those who want more accuracy. Then, of course, in the U.S., the number of meters in length would need to be converted to feet and inches. After figuring out what the electrical length of an antenna is, the design is adjusted for velocity factor. Antennas show the effect of the slowing of signals as they travel along the antenna's length. Known as end effect, velocity factor in antennas is the result of the interaction of the wave front of the signal with the dielectric material surrounding the conductor, in this case our atmosphere. Some antennas are less affected. Thin wire antennas have less velocity factor correction. But thick antennas, those with large cross-sectional areas, are impacted more by velocity factor. Reducing the physical length by approximately 5% will compensate for velocity factor, and antenna manufacturers take this into account when designing antennas. The radiation pattern of an omnidirectional dipole antenna is roughly a donut shape as shown. The antenna is the vertical line at the center of the diagram. It radiates in all directions except off the ends of the antenna, up or down. The illustration is a cross-section of the pattern. The E field or electrostatic field is used to reference the direction of the energy leaving the surface of the antenna and is at 90 degrees to the plane of the antenna. If the dipole is oriented vertically, the vertical radiation pattern or E field pattern would be as shown. The actual radiation pattern would show that the field is not perfectly round or spherical. A half wave dipole is often used as a reference for antenna gain. A single half wave dipole has zero dBd gain, which is 2.15 dB over an isotropic source. 0 dBd equals 2.15 dBi, and as discussed previously, there is no magic in antenna gain. The pattern is redirected. Antenna gain is the result of the redirecting of the energy coming from the antenna so that it is transmitted in a more usable direction. Antenna gain is specified as the amount of increase in signal strength when compared to the output of a reference antenna, either in dBi or dBd. Be certain to understand the difference in reference antennas used in this specification. Many companies use software to plot coverage on a map. An antenna gain must be specified in dBi or dBd as required for the software to plot correctly. Multiple antennas, phased arrays, antennas with director elements, and many other designs may be directional. Some antennas, such as panel antennas used in cellular systems, show gain in the direction they face. Slotted and panel antennas used in these systems typically have a narrow signal beam. The patterns here show that varying the length of the antenna may also result in gain using a 5 8 wavelength antenna and comparing it to a quarter wavelength antenna. In any gain antenna, gain is achieved by manipulating the radiation pattern with power taken from one part in the pattern and added to another. In an omnidirectional antenna, gain is achieved by reducing the vertical beam in favor of more power in the horizontal beam. The two patterns displayed show the vertical radiation pattern of a unity gain dipole and a 10 dBd gain antenna. These patterns would be taken with the antenna mounted on a tower on a test range and taking signal strength measurements downrange. Measurements may also be taken in an anechoic chamber. Notice that the unity gain dipole has no signal off the ends of the antenna and has gain at 90 degrees to the length of the antenna. The 10 dBd collinear antenna pattern falls off very quickly above and below the horizontal axis. 
The vertical beam width is specified as the angle between the points above and below the main lobe where the signal has been reduced by 3 dB. The antenna pattern on the right also shows a slight amount of down tilt with more signal under the antenna than above. In reading these polar graphs, keep in mind that the graph shows where the signal is going, not how far it goes. Beam width is determined by measuring the power of the signal at the center of the main beam, and then moving away from the center until the signal falls by half, or 3 dB, and measuring the angle of change. This is the beam width, or the angle of acceptance, for the antenna. A wider beam will direct the radiated energy into the ground sooner. This is very important on high towers and mountaintops. These antennas usually have lower gain because more energy is radiated above and below the main beam. Beam width can be illustrated with the beam of a light from an adjustable flashlight. As the beam is adjusted wider, the intensity falls. By narrowing the beam of light, the intensity becomes brighter, but the area of coverage is reduced. Some types of antennas exhibit a nearly identical pattern, both horizontally and vertically, looking into the side of the antenna or looking at it from the top down. Beam width is one of those characteristics that needs to be identified in both directions for some software. Antenna specifications for gain and directivity come from a manufacturer's testing. There are multiple types of gain antennas, some impacting signals and coverage more than others. In the land mobile radio industry, it is customary to specify antenna gain in DVD, but some antenna manufacturers specify gain compared to an isotropic antenna, or DBI. This can be converted to the gain of a half-wave dipole by subtracting 2.15 dB. A 12.15 dBi antenna is equal to 10 dBd. Antennas are designed for a specific response and frequency, as well as gain in a certain direction. The bandwidth characteristic is how wide of a frequency range an antenna operates at. Antennas act like a filter at non-resonant frequencies, rejecting RF power sent to them that is not within their response range, but they should never be considered as stopping signals. All RF passing over the surface of an antenna produces some voltage in the antenna, but it is stronger at the frequency the antenna is cut for than at other frequencies. Remember that standing waves are generated when there is a mismatch between components in a system, and the same is true of antennas. The specification for directivity is slightly different than gain, as gain is an overall increase in signal power compared to a reference antenna while directivity is a measure of the amount of power an antenna would receive in its peak direction when compared to a reference antenna in DBI or DBD. Directivity is a measure of how much the energy from an antenna is concentrated in a single direction between the 3 dB points on the pattern. Directional antennas achieve gain and directionality by taking signal from part of the pattern and redirecting it into another part of the pattern. A common type of directional antenna is the Yagi antenna. Gain is based on the number of elements used. Using multiple elements directs the RF energy in the forward direction with gain of about 7 dB for four elements. The beam width of an antenna is the number of degrees within which an antenna will transmit or receive a signal. The antenna's pattern is measured by finding the point of maximum signal and then moving to either side of that point until the signal strength falls by 3 dB. Other types of directional antennas include corner reflectors, which are manufactured in several different configurations, but basically add a corner reflector behind the driven element to direct signal in the forward direction. A log periodic, while being directional, is very broadband, sending and receiving signals across a broad range of frequencies. All multi-element antennas, like the log periodic, use multiple elements to shape the pattern and achieve gain in a specific direction. Panel antennas are similar to corner reflectors and place a plate behind the active element 
to reflect the signal from one direction into the forward path of the antenna. An antenna is made more directional by adding more elements, and as it becomes narrower in beam, it increases in gain or distance covered. Antennas have unique coverage or transmission patterns associated with each one. They are unique and it is important to understand the pattern of each type. The two plots on the slide show a dipole antenna on the left and a 10 dBD collinear stacked dipole on the right. While the collinear antenna does have gain, it also has good fill underneath and not a lot of signal going upward. Both of these are good characteristics when laying out coverage in a large flat area, but may not work in mountainous terrain. As noted, pattern or gain cannot be shown using normal test equipment. While a spectrum analyzer will show signal and power levels, to show pattern either the spectrum analyzer must be moved in the signal area or the antenna must be rotated while recording signal levels. The only technique that works to establish the pattern is measuring field strength using multiple samples. The scale on the antenna pattern shown is not in watts or milliwatts or dBm or dBi or dBd, but simply in dB. The plot does not show how much power is being applied to it from the transmitter. Patterns are produced on an antenna test range away from all other influences or in an anechoic chamber. Remember that an antenna is impacted by what is around it and what interacts with it. This pattern shows two antenna plots overlaid, showing that they are very similar in their characteristics, but the green plot has more down tilt, more fill underneath, and more power in nearly all directions with more field strength in all directions, more coverage in all directions. The reference or fixed power level is set at zero dB. By moving around the antenna at a fixed distance and measuring power levels, the signal will be some part or level of the reference. The zero dB points on the plot are all at reference power level, and power can be assumed to be any value or can be transmit power output. As you move around the antenna, the power levels rise and fall from the reference level. Looking at the zero and the 180 degree points on the circumference of the plot shows that the green plot is down tilted by about six degrees. The green plot appears to have about five to 10 dB more gain in all directions compared to the purple plot, except at the horizons where they are nearly equal. The polarization of an antenna is a function of the antenna's orientation to the ground and to other antennas. A dipole antenna pointing straight up or perpendicular to the ground is vertically polarized, while an antenna made from a wire stretched between trees is horizontally polarized, being parallel to the ground. Antennas with the same polarization will transmit and receive from each other better than those that do not match. Polarization may be developed physically or electrically within a system. The electric fields that emerge from the antenna are used to identify the polarity of the antenna, with the E field being parallel to the long axis of the antenna. If one antenna is rotated 90 degrees compared to another antenna, it will be cross-poled and will receive at 18 to 20 dB less signal than if the antenna were at the same polarity. Most often in mobile communication systems, antennas are vertically polarized as the user holds the device in an up position. However, we all know that cell phones will work lying flat on a car seat as well as next to the user's head. Many handheld devices use loop antennas internally or use multiple antennas to improve polarity as needed. The two most common polarities used at sites are vertically and horizontally polarized antennas. Beam tilt is a method of solving coverage problems within the signal footprint. Beam tilt helps get signal into areas near or underneath antennas, on high towers or high elevation sites such as mountains, bringing the signal down into the area needed. There are two types of beam tilt, 
mechanical beam tilt, and electrical beam tilt. Mechanical tilt is caused by mounting the antennas with a slight downward tilt using the appropriate mounting brackets. Electrical down tilt uses multiple antenna elements mounted in a single tube that are fed the signal at slightly different phase angles. Care must be taken when mounting down tilted antennas that they are aimed and down tilted properly. An electrically down tilted antenna that is inverse mounted will result in an up tilted antenna with coverage suffering. The illustrations shown are simplifications of beam tilt, but do show the impact of either mechanical or electrical beam tilt. In most cases, the main beam of the pattern will go beyond the horizon, possibly reducing the coverage area as the signals go over the users. By adding beam tilt, the main beam can be brought down to cover more of the area. This produces the highest amount of energy close to the antenna, but may reduce the coverage area. In most cases, the distance a system can talk will be limited by the RF power available and not the RF horizon. Thank you for being part of this training module, for inquiring about TXRX systems and services, and for being part of our technical community. This section was intended as an introduction to antennas and theory. More training modules are available in support of this and other topics specific to products manufactured by TXRX systems. The material is available in short versions and in longer half-day, full-day, and two-day classes. Visit our website at txrx.com for more information. Titles and topics are being added weekly, so please come back often to see what is available. Classes are available at TXRX Systems 8625 Industrial Parkway, Angola, New York, or if your group or shop is large enough, we will bring the training to you. Please call 716-549-4700 to discuss fees and scheduling. Again, thank you for being part of this presentation, and we do invite you back.